Okay. Uh, Caden Wang started sport fencing in 2010 during college. In 2015, he decided to pursue historical fencing and joined the Sacramento Sword School. He was expecting to learn Italian raper and was pleasantly surprised to find La Verdadera de Stereza and quickly fell in love with it. In 2017, he joined the Diamond Rose Academy, the arms, to apply Destreza techniques against other rapier styles. With increased exposure to other systems and an introduction to Viedma's method of teaching masters, he started to develop his own method of applying Destreza theory. He's traveled the fence in open competitions and medaled using Destreza. Uh, when I say medaled, I mean he came in first. Uh, he became an instructor at arms for Sacramento Sword School in 2019 under a traditional board examination. And one of the signs that you're you're doing a good job with a distress of student is when they begin to challenge your ideas using some of the theory of the tradition. At that point, they move from being a consumer of the tradition into a contributor to the tradition. And some of his uh, ideas may challenge things that I've said. In fact, uh, he does that pretty regularly. But in my mind, that's a feature of the Destreza rather than a problem that we need to solve. He's a really good resource for practical Destreza advice. And he's going to provide some guidance about fencing using Destreza strategy and tactics, with, uh, which I think could be pretty useful. And I expect this to be a pretty crunchy discussion. So we will work to ensure that as we get into the jargon, we don't leave anybody behind. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Kaden Wang, and I'm an instructor at arms for Sacramento Social School. And as you guys know, we do the Verdader de Sousa. Um, I'm also a part of a uh, transitional rapier club, um, by the Rose Academy of Arms. Um, they actually use similar length swords as us. So they use about 36 to 38 inch swords, and then we use like 32 to 36 inch swords. So when I joined up with them, there wasn't like that big of an issue in terms of like fencing. Uh, and then I also fence in the SCU. Um, and I'm going to talk to you guys about how I apply this transfer theory against like any other fencing system. Uh, but before we do that, um, we got to understand like the purpose of this transfer. So uh, the Edma in his book, he says very explicitly that the purpose is to destroy the vulgar side. Um, and he repeats this throughout his book, and that's, I don't know, I don't quite agree with that. So we got to go back to the beginning, to Carranza. Okay, so what does Carranza think about this? Um, I think what Carranza really wanted was to impart sound judgment onto young men, and that manifested in the form of fencing. Because in this book, he talks a lot about um, the poor fencing in the marketplace and how everyone was using a bag of tricks. Um, so I don't think Carranza was against the vulgar techniques per se, but he was against using techniques that you don't understand. So you need to choose the correct technique in the different situations that you find yourself in. Um, so that raises an interesting question. Um, does this mean that like Liberta Dare is terms of like true techniques can also be vulgar. And the answer is uh, undoubtedly yes. And then um, Vietma also sees this, right? He calls those fencers wise vulgars. Um, fencers who use the stressor techniques, but something's kind of off. And then in particular, he points out people who use the Atajo wrong. And that's very vulgar. Um, a Tahoe, yeah, it's very powerful, but it can be easy to deceive and uh, defeat you. And also, you may have better choices instead of just running to the Atahoe. So how do we fix this problem of, you know, vulgar offenses using a Tahoe wrong? Um, you just choose not to use the Atahoe. Um, because again, a Tahoe, a lot of the times, is the wrong choice. Um, for example, like someone fencing with this sword refused, or with their tip pointed at your waist, um, you can't atahoe that, right? And then other things you can't atahoe is if they, they're like an epi fencer and they lunge at your toe 
but you're not going to follow that thrust. Right? You have to um, refuse your body and stop thrust in the arm or the face. So you got to use that right angle as a defense, and especially because it's the long range defense that he has chosen. Right? So before we get into how I apply the theory, we got to go over the terms in theory um, so that we're all on the same page. So first up uh, is movements. Um, we all know we can move forwards, backwards, side to side, right? And then this, our swords can move up and down. Uh, but I want to talk about two broad categories of movements, executive and dispositive. Um, so an executive movement is any movement that leads, right? So like a thrust or your lunging or the final movement of a cut. And then dispositive movements are like any other type of movement. That doesn't lead. You guys have any questions on that? No? Okay, moving on. Uh, next up is the three particular defenses, uh, as Pacheco lines them out. Um, the first up is the right angle, right? It's your longest range defense, and it takes one executive movement to execute. And I think it's a dispositive movement generating machine, right? And then a Tahoe is the next longest range defense. Um, you use it to subject your sword when they attack, and it can be used offensively when you want to close the distance to attack in a safer way. Um, but you're in a sword fight, so you're never going to be perfectly safe. And it has three dispositive movements, right? Up, side, and down. And then there's the conclusion. Um, it's the shortest range defense, and I don't want to talk about that in this one. And then we have our three timing contexts. Um, we have before, during, and after. Um, so timing contexts, they're like the time that surrounds actions we can perform. Um, so the before is when you seize the initiative, right? You're acting when your opponent hasn't done anything. They're just standing there. So for example, you lunge at them, um, you've acted in the before, or when they're just standing there in right angle, you um, place a Tahoe and then you step to medio proposi now and then you attack, right? As long as they haven't moved, all of that is in the before. And then does the during, um, when you're uh, acting in time, your opponent is in the middle of a, this, of a dispositive movement. For example, they try to take a Tahoe on you and you disengage and thrust them through the arm. Or they step closer to you and in the middle of their step, you take an Tahoe on them. And then lastly, we have the after timing context. Um, it's when you act after they finish performing an action. And for this lecture, I'm just going to talk about it in terms of attacks. So when you act in the after, you're responding to their attack. Um, for example, they lunge at you, you place um, a Tahoe, and then you repose. Both the Tahoe and your repose are in the after, because it's after they have attacked. Um, Actually, also, if you counterattack their attack, your counterattack is also in the after. So, for example, they lunge at you and then you uh, gain degrees of profile and you thrust them through the chest. Right. I have a question about that. Yeah. Let's say somebody is loading a cut, right? Uh, in classical fencing notation, that would be uh, a single action, right? I could counterattack that while the cut's being chambered. Um, would that be in the before, the during, or the after in the context you described? Um, that would be the, the during because the chambering of the cut is a dispositive uh, movement because their sword is moving backwards, so they can't possibly move. But if um, their sword starts to move forward, right, and then you stop thrust them through the arm, that would be an after because they've started their. Um, They've already began their executive movement. Thank you. 
Okay. Oh, we have a question from uh, Tim Rivera. Okay. Uh, he wants to know if it's possible to act in the during against the thrust. Uh, <laughs> that's a complicated topic. I don't want to get into that. <laughs> um, I guess you, I guess it, it depends on how far they are. Um, if you, um, well, no, no, you can't because their thrust is exactly. Yeah, we have somebody that suggests that if they're prepping a thrust, I think the there's the punching thrust where they withdraw the arm. Yeah, no, but that's two movements, right? So that's right. I agree. One dispositive, one executive. Um, it depends how. Could, yeah, go ahead. It depends on how granular you want to slice it. Are you looking at the treta level where the punching thrust is is a treta, or are you looking at it movement by movement? I think movement by movement. You're right. Yeah. No, but the, like there's a case where like if someone lunges at you from so far away that you know they can't hit you and then you stop thrust them. Not quite. I guess you could argue um, both ways, but I would just consider that um, an after because it's still their attack. So does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. All right, next up, we have the three considerations. Um, they're closely related to the three timing contexts. Um, they are propio, disposition appropriado, and transferido. And each of those correspond to a timing context. So propio corresponds to before. Um, it requires no movement from your opponent. Um, so I'll use the same example as before, right? My opponent just stands there and I take a Tahoe step to ready for course now and attack. Um, this position of propiato corresponds to the during timing context. Um, it's your opponent um, gives you a dispositive movement that you can take advantage of. So going back to the example I used before, um, they try to take a Tahoe. All movements in the Tahoe are dispositive. So they gave me disposition appropriado for me to disengage and thrust them through the arm. Um, and then we have transferido, and that corresponds to the after. Um, is defined as uh, taking the outcome my opponent sought for myself. Um, so when they attack, you subject with a Tahoe and repose, but right? you uh, stop their attack and then now you're attacking yourself. So you took what they wanted and then you, uh, you got it for yourself. And you can apply this concept to other things like um, a Tahoe, but uh, I don't want to get too deep into that. So moving on. So before I move on, does anyone have any questions about that? All right. Okay, next up is uh, defensive distance or medio de proporcion. Um, so it's the minimum distance you need to effectively defend yourself uh, while also being able to formulate your offense. So to me, the key word here is minimum, right? So you always want to stay at the minimum safety distance away from your opponent, right? And then there's been a few lectures um, before where they said that the tip to pommel distance outlined in the book right, isn't working out. Right? They're still getting hit. But, and the important thing about Distrezza is that you have to remember Distrezza is about choice. So if you're always using that tip, their tip to your pommel distance as a measuring stick, 
um, are you really choosing or are you just following what the text says? Right, and I'm pretty happy to hear that um, people are choosing to stay farther away from lunch-based systems, um, like the Italian and French schools. Right, so they've uh, consciously made a choice based off of the context that they encounter, you know, to stay farther back than what the text says. And I think Carranza would be uh, definitely happy and proud about that. Um, so when I was reading the Edmund's treatise, um, I noticed something interesting. Um, is that whenever he talks about his um, atajo based drills, he would always say something like, having chosen medio de proporción, then you place the atajo and then you do the rest of the drill. But he doesn't say, at medio de proporción, do X, Y, and Z. And I think that's a pretty, uh, like the concept of choosing um, is, a, is pretty telling. Um, so you need to actively pick medio de proporción, and you don't just happen to be at medio de proporción. And it's and at that point, it's also not just about the distance; it's also about like when you're there, so like like the timing of when you reach medio de proporción. So we have a question from the audience. Yeah. Um, so if we understand um, medio de proporción as a choice uh, with these important con um, pieces to it. Um, would you advocate a longer distance for your defensive medio against Italian lunges? Um, not necessarily, because medio de proporción changes um, depending on what's happening. Um, I don't want to give too much away from here, but when you're like just trying to keep yourself safe and you're not necessarily thinking about how to move them, you're not really at medio de proporción. You're just keeping yourself well defended. Um, but I'll I'll talk more about um, changing the distance of medio de proporción later on. Um, is that you want me to talk more about that, or is that? No, I think that's interesting. That's good. Thanks. Okay. Right. So we just talked about, um, you know, you can effectively defend yourself, but right. So it's not like just because you can effectively defend yourself, it doesn't mean that the minimum defense, right? You can formulate your offense. So there's a way that we can get pretty close to your opponent. Um, so we're going to talk about that next. And that way is accompaniento. Right, so accompanientos are attacks that can change based off the opponent's reactions. Um, and it's a dispositive movement generating machine. Um, there's two types of accompaniento. There's perfecto and imperfecto. So Carranza defines perfecto as an attack going to the face. Um, however, other authors usually only talk about it performing uh, perfecto only when you have a taho and you step to medio proporcional and you're attacking the face with the blind. Um, and then Pacheco specifically talks about this, I think it is 18 contradictions and 100 conclusions. Um, also, interestingly, in Viedma's dagger section, when he fences against uh, like sword refuse styles, he he has plays where he feints to their face and then to draw their dagger parry and disengages under. He doesn't call that feint a comodimiento. He just says your tip travels to their face. So that's pretty interesting. So to me, like perfecto, it's only done from the top. And then imperfecto um, is just a faint going to the arms or thighs. And I don't think even Pacheco repeats that. So that's, that's a good sign, I suppose. <laughs> okay, so now we can get into how I apply the distress of theory. Um, so I use this against um, 
mainly the uh, against Diamond Rose because they're a French rapier school, and then also in the SCA, and this will work against other DS as well. Um, and generally, I don't try to place a Tahoe on anyone. Um, we're told that a Tahoe is like the greatest thing in the world, right, in Distreza, and we should always, you know, try to get a Tahoe. But that's not, like, th is that really good Distreza, just doing what you're told? Right, so let's look at some other things we can do. And why a Tahoe is a bad choice. Right, so first up, you're giving up your longest range defense, right? Because right angle is your furthest defense from your opponent. Um, and if you start seeking a Tahoe at the wrong distance, you're really susceptible to a quick disengage thrust in your eye. Right? And why can your opponent do that? Because a Tahoe is composed of three dispositive movements, right? Up, side, and down. And then there's no executive movement to threaten your opponent. Also, um, yeah. um, huh? you think that uh, that a Tahoe has fewer movements if you're doing it from mixed angle rather than from right angle? Does that make a difference in that calculation? Um, hmm. I guess at that point, you're just pushing your sword laterally to the side, depending on how low the hand already is. Um, but still, like, because a Tahoe has that subjection element, so you definitely still want to move your head down. I guess not all the time. Uh, wait, sorry, what was your question? <laughs> <laughs> if, if instead of starting from, from right angle, if you're starting right. from mixed angle, does your Tahoe then have fewer movements? And does that change the at all the the math of your uh, assessment okay. of a Tahoe? Um, it it can. Um, I think the main issue with a Tahoe is that you. I'm going to talk about this a bit later, but you need some form of resistance from your opponent, so you need some way to generate that. Um, so that's the biggest factor um, when it comes to placing a Tahoe rather than necessarily how many movements there are in it. It also sounds to me like you're critical of a Tahoe for um, shortening reach and losing center line, because there's a lateral component to it. Yeah, and then there's, a, there's another component towards it that the authors don't talk about, because um, not exactly sure why, but uh, so I'm going to get into that next. So there's a um, hidden backwards component when you move your sword laterally from full extension. Um, so your hand moves backwards. And then so if your guard is your buckler, right? Your buck a buckler works by creating a cone of defense. So when you pull your hand when you pull a buckler back, right, you expose uh, more of yourself. So that's uh, really detrimental to take a Tahoe from right angle. Um, unless, of course, your guard is past their tip already. So that's why it's okay to a Tahoe as a defense, because their tip is moving um, so much like, faster and closer to you um, compared to how much your hand is moving backwards. So we'll look at that right now. So here's you, here's the threat, and then here's your uh, guard in right angle. So when you take a Tahoe, right, your hand ends up backwards and that cone of protection um, decreases and you're totally, ex not totally, but you're exposed on the outside line. So especially with um, systems that fence bent arm, right, they can do a quick disengage and hit you in the arm as you try to take a Tahoe. Right, you're pulling your um, defense away. You're opening yourself up. So 
So another. Oh, I, problem. Do, I do have one question. Yeah. With uh, with your opinion on Tahoe, how does it feel to burn in Destreza Hell for all eternity? <laughs> <laughs> I just keep the flames at bay with my writing. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> okay. So. <laughs> Um, so there's more issues with a Tahoe, right? So a Tahoe is a type of bind, right? And then all binds require um, the opponent's resistance. Um, and in this case, uh, it's best if they violently resist your Tahoe, right? You want them to move. You want them to move this sort of up while you subject them downwards, right? So, um, but just because you put your sword on top of someone, it doesn't mean they're subjected, right? You can place a tall on someone and they're just gonna flop their arm. So they're gonna uh, end up in a cute angle. And when they're in a cute angle, you're not really holding onto the sword. So if you try to glide on that, so if you try to do the common thing with the perfecto, um, you're gonna end up with the sword through your gut, right? So it's not. That's not fun. And then the last or the last issue that I'm going to talk about is if you put if you place a Tahoe on someone, right, your opponent knows that they're at a disadvantage. So they're not going to hang around for you to step to many of the boards or not. So they're going to back away. And um, so so those are like the main issues I have with the title. But since... we have a question. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and maybe maybe this is a, like a point of challenge. So I want you to okay. think, about, think about this. Um, when you move with a curved step and stay behind your sword, um, when placing the Atal, wouldn't that also then put you behind the cone of defense uh, when taking an Atal? Um. If you step behind, you mean like at the same time? So you're placing a tile and stepping at the same time, or yeah, uh, yeah, that that helps. Um, I think that's why Vienna That's why Vienna advocates putting your your arm, sword, and body at the same time. Yeah, it would help, and then. Um, so there's other ways we can utilize a tongue and um, kind of fix these problems. So I'm going to get into that uh, right now. So you, despite all those drawbacks of a tongue, you can still you know use the tongue if you do. Um, so the key to that is to take a Tahoe during their disposition to grow the so they can't really threaten you. And not to do it um, yeah, from right angle. So you want to um, push cut your sword into there to get them to resist the bind. Because if you're if you go from like from on top, they're likely to flop their arm. But if you push their, uh, their tip like laterally, they're more likely to resist. Um, and also, right, starting from a bent arm and moving your hand forward, you're pushing your guard forward, so you're also increasing your opponent defense. Um, so I have like three like plays that I use. Um, I don't have any fancy names for them, so we're just gonna cover them. So the first one is to change the depth of um, the Atajo. So again, you don't start at full extension, and then during the dispositive uh, steps, you push cut into the sword. And then normally, I drop my hand um, to my rib cage level, and I let them get away. Uh, I place the towel on them. I don't want to chase them too hard because I want them to. It's okay that they get away, but I don't want. I, I want them to get away in like a controlled. Manner, so I repeat that a few times so I can get a read on how low they're disengaging and how far back they step away. And so once I get a good feel of that, I um, 
Once I place a Tahoe, I'm going to drop my hand deeper and then step really deeply into the idea of the force of the So to start off with, I have a pretty shallow a Tahoe's. And then I do that a few times. And then when I'm ready, I'm going to drop my hand like a lot deeper and then step a lot closer to them so I can catch their sword under mine. Um, they may, there may not be like um, any resistance here so I'll put my offhand and I'll put my offhand in the way so that um, sorry um, so once I'm in this position I like to offhand this sword and half reverse it in mass. I don't want to necessarily glide because their arm is probably still um, floppy so I don't want to risk a double um, but if I do feel resistance then I can just um, Go ahead and thrust to the chest or the mask. So when you say offhand the sword, could you describe, uh, are you doing a conclusion on the outside of their sword? Uh, no, so... Um, are you beating so, it a tip away? Yeah, yeah, I'm beating their tip away with my left hand. Okay. Yeah. And then another way I, I like to make a Tahoe work is to use Vietnam's rounded Atahos. Um, I kind of, I expanded on his rounded Ataho drill. He doesn't specifically outline what I'm going to uh, describe. So um, to start off, it's it's just Vietnam's rounded Ataho drill, right? So you place a Taho on them, they disengage and they step backwards, and you follow with a well, rounded Ataho or um, and then you can keep doing that, right? But it has no end, right? Because you're going to place a tahoe, they're going to get away. You're going to place a tahoe again, and then they're going to get away. So can you um, define uh, the action around a tahoe? Okay, so it's like um, a circular parry, I guess. Um, you just turn your wrist in a circle. So when they, so um, for like the inside line. Um, I place the Tahoe, and then when they disengage around my hilt, I perform a uh, weak over-like movement to regain the Tahoe. Thank you. Okay, and then, so I do that a few times, and then that's also to get a reading on how they disengage and how far back they step. And then once I understand um, how they're disengaging and how far they're stepping, I basically do the same thing as before, where I drop my hand deeper for the next round of Tahoe and I step in deeper to them. And then the finish is the same, I offhand their sword and then half reverse it in the mask. And if they resist, I'll just glide into them. Oh, right, I have a video. Oops. Can everyone see this? Yeah, which one of them will be the diestro? Oh, uh, the one on the left is the diestro. Right, so we saw the diestro, um, his response to the disengage is the rounded atajo to regain the atajo. And then here he's read my timing, and then so he's going to rapidly close in with the offhand and then attack me. Anyone have questions about that? Okay, moving on. Oh, uh, we do have a question. Oh, okay. Um, so um, regarding the circling action, you said a weak over movement. The question is, is that like an envelopment or a change of point line to low outside? Uh, yeah, that's, that's like an envelopment, I think. Well, so your action starts with the Tahoe on the inside line and yeah. what's the terminating point to that action? Um, a Tahoe on the inside line again. 
Okay. Oops. And then the last one um, is to get them to come to you. So for this one, you're going to start by uh, curve stepping to the right, and then they need to follow you. So they also need to curve step to their right. If they don't, this isn't going to work. Um, but so you're going to curve step right. They're going to follow. And then at some point, you're going to fake a step to your right. And then because they think you're moving to the right, they're still coming, right? Um, so they're still coming. And then in the middle of their step, you're going to place a Tahoe on their sword. And because body and sword is still in motion and they're getting close to you, um, there's that subject or there's that resistance. So you can um, perform a Comitimiento Perfecto to their face. So you're when not you're taking. Oh, sorry, I have, I have a question about the feet. Yeah. When you take the curved step to the right, which is a deception, yeah. um, are you stepping with the right foot and then pushing off it to go left first, or how are you doing that? Uh, so I step with the right, and my left foot follows. Um, wait, I'm, I'm, I don't. So um, you said that you're not actually taking a step to the right, or it's deceptive in some way, but then you say oh, that oh, you... Oh, that one. Oh, OK. So with that, um, I, so let's say, like, for these steps, I move my feet. I move my right foot, like, um, I don't know, one and a half foot to the right. Um, for here, I um, fake the step. It's only, like, a few inches to the right. But I, I still need to give them like the notion that I'm still moving to my right. And then once they once they come closer to me, I push off of my right foot. And then I take a Tahoe, like I place a Tahoe and then my left foot lands roughly at the same time. Does that does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, that's just a question. OK. So for this one, I'm not like stepping to my manual proportion now. They're coming to my manual proportion. So. All right, so for me to use um, a Tahoe offensively, um, I set up a pattern, right? and then I break the pattern. Um, or to put it in another way, um, I create a context, and then I understand that context, and then I choose uh, when to act once I fully understand what's going on. But like I said earlier, I don't try to seek it out um, most of the time. Right? So to understand why, like we need to under uh, we need to look at what we're using the towel for. So we're using it to generate dispositives from our opponent. But the Atajo itself is three dispositive movements, and you have to get closer to your opponent for it to work um, compared to the right angle. And then there's a lot of opportunities for your opponent to hit you right, in the during timing context. So even like if you look at what happens with Atajo and the common element of the the ideal like uh, just as a drill from books, you're still triggering their panic parry, right? So you can disengage and hit them somewhere else at liberty, right? Your second attack isn't even necessarily um, in the bind. So all in all, right? Like seeking a Tahoe um, is just harder and riskier, and it kind of results in the same thing as um, starting your attack. Um, with your blade free, right? So, I primarily use right angle when I fence other people, even other diestras. Um, so, 
So I, I, yeah, so I use Rhinango because it's the longest range defense. Um, it's a dispositive movement generating machine um, via Comitamiento Imperfecto. Right, because right angle has its one executive movement compared to the three positive movements. It works farther away, it threatens your opponent. And because you're farther, um, you have more distance to react to your opponent. And then it, again, it, dis it generates a lot of dispositive. movements. So to maximize um, a common dimiento imperfecto, um, when I'm out of distance, I'm not at full extension because um, generally your opponents need a visual cue to react um, to your threats. And the rapid extension works uh, really well. So I disagree with the iconography and the descriptions of the astros being straight legged and straight armed. Um, because while well, artists aren't fencers and descriptions are very prone to exaggeration. Um, also, Figueredo specifically talks about not assuming the right angle um, when you're out of distance. So, how do I use a Comitimiento Imperfecto? Um, so, when is the best time to attack someone? It's when they're distracted or um, they're in the middle of a dispositive, so in a during timing context. So usually I accommodate the to their wrist when they're sleeping. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so um, I accommodate the imperfecto to their wrist, right? Ideally in the middle of their step. And um, they, that, that inevitably leads to them giving me disposition appropriado for me to take advantage of. Um, because they're mid-step, they can't threaten me, and then so I'm well defended while I'm formulating my offense. So I'm choosing medio de proporción with um, a common imperfecto to their wrist. So, Caden, I wanted to uh, point out, I was going to do this earlier, but it seemed like you were on a roll. So, one of the things that I, I think that's really interesting that you've done here is you've used Estreza theory to address the same problems that you know, other systems address, but you've come pretty close to Italian theory also, right? So, it's really interesting to see you uh, uh, identifying the problem and identifying a, uh, an approach to solving it, which turns out to be a similar technique as Italians use, but you're doing all of this um, really strongly in a Destreza context, right? It's like you're not you're not talking about it as an Italian, you're talking about it as a as a diastro. I think it's really interesting to see, not just the Tahoe, but even here when you're in in the uh, the generating dispositives and talk about footwork, um, you're, you're generating opportunity. That's what the Italians look at also. Yeah, the, the way I look at like fencing systems is that like different systems, they try to, we're all like describing the same things, but just from a philosophically different perspective. And um, those perspectives will like highlight, um, like, well, well, not highlight, but they'll emphasize different um, aspects of the theory, I guess. But yeah, uh, we're all trying to describe the same movements and all of that, so. But it's nice to see you do it as a diestro, not switching languages to someone else's system to describe it. I like it. I think one of the other interesting things about this, um, where you're using right angle to form acometimiento and perfecto, is um, the first time I fought with Ton, uh, I think he did that to me about eight times in the course of like five or six minutes. It, w it was really effective. Um, so certainly some of the people in the community are putting this into practice as well.
Yeah. So, um, so when you like think at their risk, right in the middle of the step. Um, so let's look at some of the reactions that they can have. Um, so because they're mid step, they can't move backwards and they can't move forwards. So what can they do exactly? Um, one is they can oops, um, just extend their arm. And when you do that, that's not exactly disposition of Opiato anymore. That's transfer, but that's fine. Um, so once they extend their arm, you're just going to place a toggle and then you know what to do from there. Um, and then another reaction is that they could parry shallow. Um, and if it's shallow enough, you can just perform movement of increase and then back into the top. You know what to do from there. If your opponent parries uh, really deep, you can disengage to an open line to continue your attack. Or if they make contact with your sword, um, you can use the force to throw a cut at them and continue your attack. And if, if they don't do anything, like they're just, you know, shifting their weight, right? Because they're in the middle of the movement, you just close the line and then thrust them wherever it's safe, like to their um, upper arm or their body, you can get there. I have a question. Yeah. So um, you've used a commitimento imperfecto to generate a dispositive in the adversary um, that's shallow and you're going to throw an Atajo on top of that. Um, but if a Tahoe is three dispositive movements, why is it okay here and it's not okay, say, in the proprio? Um, because you're at um, Medio de Proporción, so you can effectively defend yourself. And also at that distance, um, when they extend, their point is probably past your hilt. So it's safe to take a toggle from your right angle. Thanks. All right, so that was how I generally fence um, systems with the sword up, blade in presence. Um, so diestros or French fences or Italian fences. But there's also uh, another kind of fencer, um, the low guard fencer. So how do I deal with those guys? Um, so again, we should use right angle and not a Tahoe because you, you cannot a Tahoe this one, right? So but first let's look at um, some things not to do. So you don't want to use a virtual Tahoe especially virtual Tahoe to the inside line. Um, so what's wrong with virtual Tahoe? Um, first of all, I think you're over relying on a Tahoe again, right? You're like, oh, a Tahoe in its name, it has to work, right? But no, not really. So, so how many lines are you open if you place virtual Tahoe inside? Right, so both outside lines for sure. But you're also open in your high inside line. Right, so how does that work? Um, they can cut right through your tip into your face. So you're not as secure as you, as you think, right? You have virtual tunnel inside, you're only closing off inside low line. And Pacheco actually does this uh, to counter your fences. Um, when they assume Puerto de Ferro, which is basically a virtual tunnel, um, he just shoots right through the tip into the chest. Um, so other problems with virtual tunnel is you're inviting to a, or other problems with virtual tunnel inside is you're inviting to a weak parry, right? Because most invites are to your inside line because you're stronger uh, going from right to left than you are from uh, left to right. Um, and then lastly, the more important thing is that you're, when you place virtual tall on the inside line, or actually virtual tall in general, is you're giving your opponent what they want, and even in the timing structure that they want, 
because um, logo referencers want that quick, faint disengage. So you're basically telling them, I'm going to do exactly what you want. So they, so just like their birthday or something, you gave them like a big present. So not a good idea. So there's a, a group of logo references called the Black Tigers and the SCA. And then they make the problem of virtual Tahoe Insight even worse. Um, so their thrusts in the propio, or uh, when they thrust, when you give them this position of propio, it's done uh, nails. So what does that mean exactly, right? So they're preemptively doing an inner kata. Um, so if you don't know what an inner kata is, it's when, um, so, so to start off, um, you gain their sword on an inside line, and then you attack by glide. And then when your opponent parries, you're going to turn your nails down and then curve around and parry. So, for to beat that, right? So as the as you feel you um, you losing your sword and you feel them curving around your tahoe, you're going to um, increase the defensiveness of your tahoe. So you're going to move your hand um, even more to your left, right? So that really exposes your outside line. So if you want to stop a uh, black tiger thrust. Um, like their first intention to us, um, you have to pull your hand like really far to your left. And that really, really exposes your outside line. Right, so you definitely don't want to do a virtual tall against the black players. So how do you deal with low guard fencers then? So um, you should use the right angle, right, to keep them away and um, keep yourself safe. Um, a big part of, of uh, fencers who use low guard, whether they know it or not, they have a huge psychological advantage over you because what they're telling you is that they don't care about doubling, so they're placing the burden of not doubling all on you, right? And they're also uh, banking on their athleticism. So I have a um, question about yeah. this. Um, you said use the right angle. Now, um, previously you said that you're going to fence with your arm relaxed somewhat, uh, couched, and you're going to present right angle situationally. Is that still true here? Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Because like right angle is like a broad, is more of a broad concept. So it's not just your arm at full extension at 90 degrees. Um, so are you directing it somewhere other than like the, the shoulder then, or um, how, are you, how else are you changing it? No, I, I'm still pointing it at their shoulder because um, I want to um, beat their sword away as it comes up from a low position. Um, and they're like sweeping beats or um, sweeping like explosions to throw their sword, uh, to throw their attack away so they can't do what they want, which is the fake disengage, right? Because if you beat their sword away or expose their sword away, they, they don't have control of their tip anymore. So um, they can't do what they want to do. Is that Answer your question. Or... Yes. Right. So you're going to maintain your right angle, and then um, you're going to be patient. And like I said uh, just now, you're going to beat this sword away or expose this sword away, and then eventually uh, you're going to kind of beat them psychologically because they can no longer do what they want, which is the fake disengage. So you can start to crowd their space slowly. And because 
your guard is ex uh, because you know your guard is extended and theirs is low, right? You have that actually a second advantage over them. And so you can slowly um, creep in the distance, and then eventually they're gonna um, you're gonna you're gonna take advantage of your extended guard, and then um, and then as you close in on them, uh, they're they're gonna attack you at like an inopportune moment, and you can subject your sword with the towel and then go for it. Um, usually, I will. A Tahoe step away and then try to cut to their mouth. But like, what about like really, really good low guard fences? Um, so that strategy won't necessarily work because again, we gotta understand low guard for a bit. So because their guard isn't in front of them, they're hyper focused on their distance and timing. So their distance and timing is probably going to be better than this, just because their sword isn't out in front of them. Because it's not, it's not like it's, they don't have that safety net anymore. Um, so you gotta get them defending themselves somehow, right? Because once their sword comes up and they parrying, it becomes the same as any other type of thing. So we can uh, do that primarily again using uh, disposition appropriado and accommodate imperfecto. So you want to attack them in the middle of their step to force their reaction. Um, so the cleanest touch I had on a really good low guard fencer was when he was trying to take me down and then he took a moderately step forward. Um, it was a little too big, so um, I was able to use accommodamiento imperfecto to his wrist uh, while gaining degrees of profile, so I'm curving to the right. And then that triggered his outside line parry, and then that gave me um, another disposition to disengage and strike him in the chest. Um, again, curving to the right, because we want to take advantage of that reach um, that you get from gaining degrees of profile. So you can also use um, Trans Frito, um, and particularly the, um, the stop thrust through an invite, right? But this one's a lot harder because you're trying to hit like a small moving target um, and they have your whole chest as their target. So, but it's definitely doable. So the way I do this is, um, well, I've done this successfully against two pretty proficient um, fencers. Um, both of them, they use the French rapier tradition. Um, so when they drop into low guard, I go into virtual tall outside line. And then once I get close enough, I drop my weight to look like I'm chasing this sword. So I drop my weight and I move my uh, arm further down. And so I'm giving them um, a cue. I'm giving them disposition appropriado for them to attack me. And when they extend their arm, because they're in, uh, their arm is lower, right? I can just stop thrust them before. So, but you may ask, like, Caden, you just told us not to use virtual atalas. So, like, what's, like, why are you using it now? Right, so the difference here is that I'm not trying to close the inside line again, because again, that's the kind of movement that they're expecting me to do. So I'm, I'm denying them like what they want to see from me. So I'm doing something they're not expecting. So that's all the um, applications of the stress of theory that I wanted to cover. Um, so to go back into the pure theory a bit, um, it's important to realize that being a diestro is about making the right choices given, given the context that you're in. So you don't want to just follow what the book says. You don't just want to follow what your instructors say or even what I say. 
right? You need to understand the context that you're in and then make the right choice for said context. And that's what makes you the estro and not just the wise mover. And that concludes my uh, presentation. Anyone have any questions? Okay. Um, Tim has a question. I'm not sure I understand it. So um, he wants to know what is appropriate. Is it appropriate or appropriate? I think he means what is the appropriate response? How do you determine that? Oh, okay. What is the appropriate res uh, what is appropriate for the response that is chosen? Um that's up to you to choose, right? Because you're the one who knows the context. Um and it's the same as formulating an opinion based off of um the context you're given or the facts that you're presenting and your interpretation of those facts. What's an inappropriate choice? <laughs> uh, the attack is an inappropriate choice. No, um, <laughs> I guess one that would um, put you in a disadvantage. Uh, oh, no, that's not necessarily true. Um, I guess something you do that doesn't like yield an outcome that you that you would like, um, that's also detrimental to you. So we have a question about a commandamiento. Can you demonstrate? Uh, so we'll, you'll have to turn off your slides, but um, it looks like the Metamento question has resurfaced in a new form for you. Can you demonstrate an accometimento imperfecto with your hand and arm in the air? Uh, just so we have an Italian fencer on the on the line, I'd like to get a sense of it. Uh, just demonstrating. Do I need a target? Maybe talk us through it so that you can, uh, and show it with your hand so that we can kind of see it. Okay, so like, like, so the way I would use it is, um, so I don't fence at like full extension per se. So I'm more here, right? Um, and then the French school I go to, they're like really bent. They're like here. Uh, there we go. Right, so I'm I'm still more extended. So it's still in like a pseudo right angle, like space. Um, because I, I use right angle like very broad. So, so from here, um, as they're uh, in the middle of their step, I just rapidly extend. And I also like to curve step to the right. Um, so, um, yeah. Ooh, that's not. Back down. So I'm, I'm here. Oh, that's back. Uh, okay. so, uh, I can't quite get the field of view to this. So I'm here, and then in the middle of their step, I'm going to rapidly extend and then move off to my right, like a mini void almost. Um, I don't know if that answers the question or. Uh, we have confirmation that it does, so thank you. Okay. Other questions? It's not a Spanish in Cortada. <laughs> and you should be ashamed uh, for thinking that. <laughs> You're just uh, gaining degrees of profile. <laughs> That's right. You have to rename it, otherwise it's false. Um, do you move both feet when you do it? Uh, yes. Because I want to move um, fully offline. When did you become a vulgar and do you enjoy it? <laughs> uh, 
yeah. <laughs> you know, the vulgar side of fencing is a pathway to many abilities, many considered to be unnatural. <laughs> Like, Caden is voted most likely to use the dark side of the forest <laughs> for the truth. <laughs> Am I aiming to the inside of the wrist? Uh, yes, yes. But all of these are, um, at least against the low guard fencer, they're mainly like right hand on right hand fencers or left or same handed fencers. Um, So you fence um, uh, in earnest quite a bit, and you went to uh, a tournament and fenced foil uh, using distress technique without like laying out details of who it was hosting the tournament and, and who you fought. Um, can you talk about that experience a little bit? Because I think you were using side sword almost exclusively up to that point, and then you picked up a foil and said, I'm gonna go do this classical tournament and see how it goes. Can you talk a little bit about the training that you did to get ready for it and what your experience was like on the day? Uh, yeah, so ooh, that was a while ago. Um, yeah, at that time, I like just started fencing outside of um, the distressed tradition with other people. So I still relied on the a lot. Um, and it, it worked pretty well. Um, so what I did was I just place the Tahoe on one side, and then um, they would disengage, and I would chase them down to the other side, and then repeat until they created a large enough disengage where I could just thrust them through the chest. But I think a lot of those fencers, they didn't, um, they weren't used to like what I was doing, so I think that threw them off. Um, So you're using um, like side to side Tahoes to pick them off. Yeah, and they just keep totally lateral Tahoes. And and then their disengagements just keep getting bigger until you can pop them mm -hmm. in the chest. Gotcha. Yeah. I think part of it was um, it was a foil tournament. Was there a right of way in classical foil? Yes. That, that so might be part of why it was working because I you know you I get that um, that blade engagement and, and I think I take right away so they have to adjust that somehow so they just chose to disengage um, a lot okay I have uh, a few more questions coming in so um, one of the things about the way that you approach the tradition is that you question um, things a lot so uh, did you did anything cause you to start questioning what you were taught or read? Um, or was it that way from the very beginning? Um, so, like when I joined up with Diamond Rose, the French transitional rapier school, like I would try a Tahoe a lot and then it just wouldn't work for me. Like I'd always get hit um, because, you know, a Tahoe is all dispositive. So, or they would just run away. Like, really fast so I'm like I didn't want to chase them down but I, they just got away again and again so I couldn't really use a Tahoe so I had to um, try other things and right angle was um, one of the things that I tried and then it worked out a lot better and then also um, sometimes like when I'm fencing like another diestro um, I will notice that um, I would take a Tahoe from, I think, too far away, and then they would just disengage under and hit me in the stomach. So I stopped trying to use a Tahoe so much after that. So I was probably attempting a Tahoe at the wrong distance, um, but now I just use right angle instead, and that works a lot better for me. It sounds really interesting. I think, God help us if the pandemic ever does clear up, I think teaching a seminar 
um, based on this would be really interesting to see how you put it together. Um, we have another question about this. Uh, how do you use movement of conclusion within the constraints of the SCA? Um, I haven't had a chance to use movement of conclusion in the SCA, well, except that one time, but that was weird. Um, I don't know what happened exactly. Uh, my opponent hung out like, like really close to me for some reason, so I just snatched his hill out of his hand. Um, but that was just, that was a very rare occurrence. Most of the time, I'm never close enough to do a conclusion. But we do practice um, in class conclusions with the dagger um, instead of using the offhand. So if I got the opportunity, that's what I would do. Uh, I would conclude with the dagger. One of the strange ironies of the SCA is that we're not safe, safe enough to touch the back of each other's arms or hilts with our open hands, but like pressing a dagger against somebody's arm is totally fine. Yeah. Um, so I've been trying out the uh, dagger based conclusions um, at, at the French school I go to. So I would, um, it's the ones where you push down with the sword and then you scoop up with the dagger. So I've been trying out those. They're a lot hard. It's a lot harder than I thought it would be, but I'm still learning how to do that. You consider that a conclusion or a disarm? Uh, I would consider that a disarming conclusion. Okay. He's not going to take the two choices you give him. See, he's got a question. No, he can, yeah, that's great. That's <laughs> We have another question from someone um, who would like to know how you address a fencer who retreats constantly out of distance. Oh, uh, you just kind of um, start, start moving more slowly um, so that, and then you read like how they're stepping backwards away from you. And you, um, and in the middle of their like step backwards, you're going to do a like rapid um, advanced lunge like uh, action. So you're saying get them to move away slowly so that you can move fast and actually reach them. Yeah. Okay. One of the things that I'm getting out of the way that you talk about fencing which is a little different from what we read in some of the books, um, but you sort of lay out an, uh, an opening game where you use actions to probe the adversary. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Um, some of the things that you use to, to read responses so that you can move into your mid game? Um, I actually just like to just um threaten them and just move into it. I don't probe too often. Um, I probably should probe more, but I like to just like flow into my attacks. Um, but when I do probe, it would, like, I'm kind of impatient in a certain way. So, but if I do want to probe, uh, I just threaten like the back of their hand or the inside of their wrist uh, a few times and then, but not like the same motion over and over again. So let's say I wanted to probe the inside line, I would do it like once and then twice. And then I would probe somewhere else, like their like their leg, and then maybe their uh, outside line. And then and then I would go back to the inside line to make sure that they're not lying to me, I guess, and then go from there. Tim had said when he asked about your, um, where did you start, when did you start questioning things? He said he was hoping for some kind of dramatic story like an Atajo had murdered your family. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> no, not, not, I mean, Atajo got me killed a lot. So, I mean, that's kind of like a dramatic. So this is like your revenge um, story yeah. against the Atajo. That's right. All right, other questions from the audience? If Tahoe isn't that great, it would have 
we would have to use Italian fencing to do it. <laughs> All right, I think that's all of our questions. So um, thank you very much for putting this all together. I think um, the the tactics that you put together and the way that you approach them, that's really interesting. Um, and I appreciate taking the time to uh, like carefully put it all together with images and explain it so that we can all follow. Um, next week, um, the lecture will be uh, me. It's about time that I have uh, also done a lecture and everyone else has donated time so I'm going to step up and give a lecture next week. Awesome. All right. Uh, thank you everybody and um, we will see you next week. <laughs>